It is that time of year when a number of staff led by, of course, our Chief Human Resources Officer will come forward and share information related to our recruit, retain, and reward efforts. And certainly this is not the first time uh, we've brought forward the issue of staffing uh, to the board. I know this is an issue top of mind to each and every board member. Um, we've had a number of discussions about how important staffing is and re recruiting, retaining, and rewarding uh, the very best for Henrico Schools. So uh, looking forward to an update, Mrs. Bolden. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kinsella, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I am Francine Bolden, Chief Human Resources Officer, and today my colleagues and I are pleased to share an update regarding recruiting, retaining, and rewarding our educators. As always, these efforts are guided by Destination 2025, the plan for HCPS, and the associated strategic goal. I would like to begin the update with a review of our retention data. During the 1920 and 2021 school years, HCPS recorded a teacher retention rate of 91%. This was particularly noteworthy when juxtaposed against the progressively challenging landscape of teacher recruitment and retention. And then the plot thickened. The COVID-19 pandemic and the great resignation drastically altered the world of employment. Correspondingly, the HCPS teacher retention rate for the 21-22 school year decreased to 86%. Teachers shared various reasons for separating from employment, the leading reason being accepting employment outside of the teaching profession. In order to fill vacancies, it is necessary to utilize a broad and multifaceted range of strategies. Today, division leaders and I will share just a few recruitment, retention, and reward strategies used in this regard. Teachers are more likely to be recruited and retained when salaries and other compensation are competitive. Our school board and board of supervisors actively work to ensure that teacher salaries are competitive, and for this school year, employees received a 5.06% salary increase. Just as we ensure the financial health of our employees, their physical health is important as well. Even with the national trend of rising healthcare costs, the division continues to cover, on average, 80% of healthcare premium costs with minimal increases to the employee premium. Additionally, the school board added to the calendar two wellness days. These are paid days off for employees with schools and offices closed. Rewarding and supporting employees is, cru I'm sorry, is crucial to recruitment and retention. In September, we were pleased to provide employees a $500 retention bonus and a one-time $500 bonus in December, an appreciation for, the de for their dedication and service. Relatedly, our employees are excellent ambassadors of HCPS, and we endeavor to reward them for their grassroots efforts to assist in staffing positions. This year, employees received $500 for employment referrals that resulted in hires. For the upcoming school year, that referral amount is increased to $1,000. For those listening, multiple referrals are accepted. Mm -hmm. In addition to these monetary incentives, the school board desired to provide further support for employees and their families. Accordingly, the board agreed to waive the non-resident student tuition for HCPS employees. This year also marked phase two of the career ladder, which innovatively connects salary advancements and personalized professional learning. You will hear more about career ladder milestones later in the presentation. <clears throat> to include the infusion of additional financial and human capital resource supports, especially as related to provisionally licensed teachers. 
In this era of never before seen vacancy numbers in the teaching ranks, the division's reliance on provisionally licensed teachers has increased tremendously, as will be discussed by Kenya Jackson, Talent Acquisition Ambassador. Good afternoon. The Henrico teacher workforce currently comprises 316 provisionally licensed teachers, which is nearly an 18.8% .8 increase from last school year. There are an additional 100 newly hired teachers within our employment ranks who we anticipate will receive a provisional license upon Virginia Department of Education review. So what does it mean to be a provisionally licensed teacher? A provisionally licensed teacher is an individual who holds a bachelor's degree but did not complete a traditional college or university teacher preparation program. In other words, they majored in something other than teaching. In order to become fully licensed, additional coursework and or assessments are required. The cost of additional coursework and assessments can be prohibitive for an aspiring teacher. To assist in this regard, HCPS pursues grant opportunities through the Department of Education and other entities. The grants are often targeted to specific teacher groups, such as minority teachers, provisionally licensed teachers, STEM teachers, or early childhood teachers, to name a few, and have various use intents. For example, may be used as recruitment incentives or to pay for courses, examinations, or assessments. Through the Virginia Randolph Legacy Grant, sponsored by the Department of Equity, Diversity and Opportunity, and HEF, eligible provisionally licensed teachers and board subs are able to receive upfront financial support to fulfill assessment requirements necessary for licensure. Easing the financial burden that can be associated with a teaching career is of the utmost importance. In just a bit, Dr. Leslie Hughes, Chief Learning Officer, and Dr. Tracy Weston, Director of Professional Learning and Leadership, will share how the career ladder supports our provisionally licensed teachers, both financially and instructionally. In addition to hiring provisionally licensed teachers as a strategy to fill essential teaching vacancies, teaching talent is acquired through teacher residency programs with our stakeholder universities. Through our partnership with the VCU Richmond Teacher Residency Program, participating individuals receive a master's degree at no cost in exchange for completing three years of employment in a hard to staff school in Henrico. The University of Richmond School-Based Teacher Education Program, or STEP, provides participants an opportunity to earn while they learn as they are afforded one half of a first year teacher salary plus benefits during their residency year. Participants are guaranteed a full-time contract in HCPS the following school year upon successful completion. Mindful of the potential within our own employment ranks, we also partner with VCU to encourage our instructional assistants to become teachers. The Richmond Teacher Residency Instructional Assistant Program provides current HCPS instructional assistants the opportunity to earn a degree in special education with no out-of-pocket cost. In addition to supporting provisionally licensed and residency teachers in the teacher pipeline, HCPS utilizes Grow Your Own programs to proactively manage the teacher applicant pool and improve retention rates by nurturing talent within our own schools and communities. Through these programs, the division builds relationships with prospective candidates as we help prepare them for future careers in education. One example of the impact of our Grow Your Own programs was showcased in last month's school board meeting, Heart of Henrico Highlight, featuring Ms. Chanel Williams. Ms. Williams is a Henrico graduate who previously attended the Glen Allen Center for 
Education and Human Development and was selected as a participant in the Henrico Teacher Scholars Program. As we watched the video highlight, we certainly saw and heard what it meant to Ms. Williams to become a teacher in the school division she attended as a student. As you recall, Dr. Cashwell previously provided you a more detailed description of our various residency and Grow Your Own programs. As we cultivate HCPS student interest in the teaching profession, we must be continually deliberate and innovative. To that end, Mr. Mac Baton, Director of Workforce and Career Development, will share with you our newest strategy to connect our students to the teaching profession. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Kenya. We always look and talk about growing our own. I'm very excited to talk about our latest efforts to grow our own teachers. Through Henrico County Public Schools Teacher Apprenticeship Program, we will be able to help our students get a jump start on their career option and also provide them with a unique set of skills that will better prepare them for the classroom. As with all apprenticeship programs, students will have the opportunity to earn while they learn. Through this high quality work-based learning opportunity, students will develop the core competencies needed to start them on their career pathway, and at the same time, through active engagements with all departments in Henrico County Public Schools, from construction and maintenance to transportation, they will learn about job-specific competencies, and at the same time, learn the Henrico County way. The value of this comprehensive knowledge of our school system will not only serve the students in the future, but also help us train and retain the valuable commodity of a new but experienced teacher. I'd like to take a minute to explain how this teacher apprenticeship model will be implemented, what this model would look like, and how students will be able to gauge in this process. Rising juniors will sign up for a new teacher apprenticeship course that will be offered at our expanded Hermitage Ace Center. They will be exposed to rigorous curriculum that includes Teachers for Tomorrow courses, dual enrollment opportunities through Reynolds, and also a detailed training agreement that will be developed, developed that outlines all the planned learning activities and expectations. These students will become a part of a cohort that will be exposed to all aspects of HCPS and continue their college journey as a cohort as well. What makes this apprenticeship model different? We know that getting students engaged early, not just through coursework, but through actual hands-on experiences helps them understand that career pathway. But having the students working early they will be able to see education from the other side and also develop relationships with current teachers who will help motivate them to continue in this career pathway. What is the value of the teacher apprenticeship model for students who have chosen to participate? They will have a clear pathway to not only becoming a teacher, but to a career in Henrico County Public Schools. Through the experiences, they will enter the profession with a much greater understanding of what it takes to become an effective teacher and also a deeper understanding of the entire educational system. For Henrico County, this is a low cost opportunity to connect students early to the profession and HCPS. I work a lot with students and companies hoping to hire them. The companies that are successful understand the value of connecting early as they connect with a purpose. By helping the students understand the full picture of education, we can take some of the unknowns out of that first year of teaching in that first real teaching job and have students well on their pathway to becoming not just a good teacher, but a great teacher for Henrico County Public Schools. Another way we are aiming to recruit, retain, and reward educators is through the career ladder. Dr. Hughes and Dr. Weston will share an update on the career ladder program and share additional support available from the Division of Learning. The HCPS career ladder is representative of a significant investment in support for our teachers. It stands as one of the most innovative and ambitious professional learning and educator advancement programs in the division's history. 
Before we provide an update, let's take a moment to review how eligible staff can be compensated through the career ladder for professional learning. The career ladder recognizes various professional pathways to achieve salary advancement, such as earning a doctorate degree, achieving national board certification, or attaining a recognized industry certification. But one of the most innovative pathways, and one that is unique to Henrico, is salary advancement through micro-credential and specialization cohorts. By completing two micro-credential professional learning programs, Teachers with five years teaching experience are, are eligible to engage with a cohort of HCPS educators to achieve a specialization in a specific topic of interest. Prior to the career ladder, teachers had limited advancement opportunities without becoming an administrator. The career ladder enables teachers to advance in the profession while remaining in the classroom to work with students. It is with great excitement that this school year, 22-23, welcome phase two of the career ladder, the official launch of micro-credentials and specializations. A micro-credential is a competency-based professional learning course or experience that provides 20 or more hours of targeted learning on a specific topic or learning series. The current list of approved micro-credentials includes nationally offered and recognized programs like advanced placement reader training and license endorsements from universities alongside new courses created within the division such as, so you want to be an ESL teacher, positive classroom management, and micro-credentials focused on the culturally responsive education model. Teachers can also be awarded a micro-credential for approved professional learning participation that occurred prior to the launch of the career ladder. For school year 22-23, over 300 teachers have enrolled in and completed micro-credentials. Another benefit of the Henrico career ladder is the opportunity to attain a micro-credential that honors high-quality professional learning earned outside Henrico schools and also incentivizing the creation of micro-credential courses for Henrico teachers that are also facilitated by Henrico teachers. In addition to micro-credentials, Henrico's first two 32-week specialization cohorts began on January 10th. 48 professionals representing all five magisterial districts in both elementary and secondary levels applied and were selected to participate in the first two career ladder specializations, teaching and learning and diverse learners. Specializations, which are much like a district design master's degree, are developed and taught by HCPSU adjunct faculty and RICO teachers and leaders, our experts in the field. Upon successful completion of a specialization, eligible staff receive a 4.8% pay increase and they're also eligible to apply to join HCPSU adjunct faculty and potentially teach future specializations. Feedback from cohort members has been overwhelmingly positive and clearly conveys the immediate impact learning experiences are having on instructional practices. As Kenya mentioned earlier in the presentation, Henrico has over 400 provisionally licensed teachers, and this group proves to be one of our greatest resources in growing our own. The minimum number of courses required for provisionally licensed teachers to attain a professional studies license is six, with each course costing approximately $800. Other provisional licenses, such as those for special education and elementary teachers, require additional courses. Without financial support, coursework can be cost prohibitive. Additionally, provisionally licensed staff only have three years to complete the required courses. Through the career ladder and pending VDOE approval, Henrico will fully fund the six required licensure courses through iTeach, while also providing internal support through in-person professional learning. iTeach is an online program that provides an alternative pathway to licensure. And one of the greatest benefits of the program is that full licensure can be attained in one year. With targeted professional learning through the lens of a Henrico educator, partnered with coursework from iTeach, eligible provisionally licensed teachers will have the resource and support needed to become confident professionals in the classroom. Support in a variety of formats is critical to teacher retention and the ability to recruit and retain highly qualified teachers. 
It is also important to highlight that career ladder funding also provides financial support for full-time employees. This support includes an increase to $1,500 in reimbursement funding for professional learning opportunities such as coursework, conferences, instructional workshops, payment of license renewal fees, and reimbursement for successfully completed praxis exams and other BDOE licensure assessments. The teacher shortage has presented challenges for the dedicated teachers in our employee, particularly those in schools in our districts which experienced high numbers of vacancies this school year, such as seen as the Verina and, and Fairfield Magisterial Districts. To bridge gaps, the division continues to provide additional resources to both staff and schools. But as a district, what additional opportunities are available, both financially and through human capital, that attract more teachers to schools that historically have had large number of vacancies? We're glad you ask. Division leaders examined a variety of data points focusing on the number of our provisionally licensed teachers, as well as vacancy data over this school year. We met with teacher focus groups, initiated conversations with school leaders, and continually reviewed excuse me, data over the course of this school year. After a thorough review of various data and remaining true to the purpose of the career ladder and the strategic goal of recruit, retain, and reward, nine schools, which are seen on the slide, will hold a career ladder designation as HCPS Opportunity Schools for the 2023-2024 school year. These schools will have additional opportunities to explore innovative resources that may prove to have a greater impact on recruiting and retaining educators. Opportunity schools receive the career ladder designation for three years, regardless of any changes in their combined rates of vacancies and provisionally licensed individuals. So what does it mean to be in opportunity schools? As shown on the slide, each opportunity school will receive additional resources, personnel, and professional learning. Within these schools, licensed instructional personnel will be eligible for additional compensation supplement of approximately $3,000. In the near future, staff from the Departments of School Leadership, Human Resources and Learning will meet with the principals from each of the Opportunity Schools to develop a specific plan for the 23-24 school year. During the planning phase, excuse me, it will be critical to continually review the data from each school and allow the principals to have voice in the planning process to meet the needs of each school. However, to provide the board with some examples of additional supports, each school could receive additional personnel, such as an administrator, permanent substitutes, and a teacher fellow. A Henrico Teacher Fellow is a highly effective classroom teacher who may spend a portion of the workday teaching students and a portion working closely with first year and provisionally licensed teachers. This new position, created with in part of the career ladder, will support new and provisionally licensed teacher with lesson design and delivery, student engagement through strong tier one instruction, co-teaching, and the day-to-day -day management of professional responsibilities. The Teacher Fellows Classroom will serve as a learning lab that models research-based instructional strategies for teachers to observe and practice. In addition, Teacher Fellows will also support PLCs, professional learning communities, and their assigned schools. Professional learning tailored to meet the needs of the teachers staff and administrators will be provided, as well as additional resources such as central support for professional learning communities that support instruction. On the slide, the board will see a timeline of events occurring thus far to plan for opportunity schools. While this list is not exhaustive of the work, it does serve to highlight the ongoing data review focus groups, principal meetings, professional learning, and differentiated support. During the summer, Opportunity Schools will receive professional development tailored to their plan and will receive ongoing support during the 23-24 school year. We hope you've enjoyed hearing updates to the strategic goal of recruiting, retaining, and rewarding HCPS as staff 
at this time, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, well, thank you. I, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Thank you, Ms. Bolden. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Weston, Dr. Hughes, and Mr. Baton. Uh, we've been waiting for this presentation as staffing has certainly been top of mind for everyone. Uh, board members, let's start with questions and comments. Uh, Mrs. Shea. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Um, thank you for all of y'all's work um, in this. We know that our people are our greatest resource uh, in our county and also the hardest to come by and to replace. And so this work is just um, tremendously important. Um, a couple questions around the career ladder. So when we looked at the micro-credential list, um, the last one listed on the, the very last one listed, said additional master degree and it had an asterisk by it. Can you? Um, yes. Tell me so, more. <laughs> uh, if, when teachers and staff who have a bachelor's degree automatically receive a grade increase, but for our staff who have multiple master's degrees or endorsements, that can count as a micro-credential for them. Wonderful. I'm excited to hear that because I know as we look at trying to increase dual enrollment offerings, our greatest hurdle there mm -hmm. is the required um, master's hours in the content area. Um, and so I'm excited to have this on the ladder because I see we have some other opportunities around AP and that sort of thing. So as we're trying to really um, broaden those opportunities across the board, I'm glad that we have um, that master's degree for the content area in there um, to hopefully be able to, to grow those opportunities for our students. Um, our, so as we look at um, these micro-credentials and um, a lot of these, some of these are national programs or programs through VCUIC or the College Board, are some of these trainings available through Henrico? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we are in the process, I think we have 20. Uh, currently for Himrico, and they are in the process of being developed as we speak. This will be an ongoing menu or catalog of options that will be created to meet the needs of our teachers. So as a teacher wants to engage in um, this kind of professional learning and, and grow a micro-credential, um, our opportunities limited is space limited? <laughs> is it a first come, first serve, or, or how are That is a great selectors? question. So yeah. they're ongoing, and right now we have not had to turn away any teachers, but we are offering multiple sections of micro-credentials. So if the case occurs that you may not be in one for the first semester, then you would be on the list to be the first for the next semester. Great. Um, excited to hear about that. I'm also really excited to hear about um, these this opportunity schools. I know this has been a conversation between the superintendent and, and board members um, for at least a couple years as I look at Ms. Ogburn nodding. And, and one of the challenging things was to figure out what's the metric, right? What's the metric that um, says which schools fall under this and not. And so I appreciate the diligent time to develop that and develop it in a meaningful way, um, as well as have that kind of three-year buffer. Um, because we're, correct me if we're wrong, we're hoping if this works, then it, it will almost, um, if it's successful, then a school will move out of that um, category, right? Because we we want the, the turnover and the provisionalized seniors, we want all of that to, to decrease. So I appreciate that there's a buffer there that the school is kind of, once you qualify, you're built in for a while so we can continue to have, because what we're really, correct me if I'm wrong, what we're really hoping for for these schools is continuity. Because we know that makes a difference for students, that makes a difference for families, but also as teachers, like I think as a first year teacher, some of my greatest resources were the teacher down the hall that has been doing this longer than I have and they've seen the things and I can pop by. And so making sure we have those resources at the school and create those continuity and those kind of natural PL opportunities in our school, I'm hoping that this will um, be a big step forward in that for those schools listed. Um, and I, I appreciate um, to that note that it's not just additional compensation, it's looking at putting those master teachers there um, and all those different pieces because it's, um, 
It's those wraparounds that help. Those first, those first few years of teaching are hard. There's no way around it. They are hard. And so having those supports that you talked about in place to help ebb the tide a little bit, to get over those first couple years. And then we'll have teachers who love that community and are invested there and can reinvest in other teachers. So I'm, I'm optimistic about this and I appreciate all the thought y'all have put into um, the pieces and developing that. Um, just one other thing which um, Ms. Bolden knows that I'm a big fan of, we've been talking about for three years, uh, but as we continue to look at other ways to think outside the box and recruit. I'll just continue to bring forth looking at job sharing opportunities, um, which is a lot easier in a secondary setting than an elementary school setting. Um, but just to be a thought leader on how to break outside that box with part-time opportunities and job sharing. And we know we have a lot of amazing educators that the last few years have been really hard, and so they've stepped away from education, but perhaps they would want to dip their toe back in in a, in a part-time setting. And a lot of times those are some of our really, really amazing teachers. And the reason they had to step away and it was too much is because they are all in. And so um, anyway, thank you for all of it. There's no easy answers here. Um, this is hard, this is hard work, um, but again, it's our greatest resource. So thank you for your thoughtful development um, of these. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Shea, Mrs. Ogburn. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure you were, okay, we're ready. Um, so thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, um, I love one of the, and I honestly don't remember, there's, so many of you presenting to us right now, I don't remember who said it, that we're continuing to be innovative. Who said that? Exactly. All of you. And, and I love that because um, I look at, um, you know, because some of us, we have the opportunity to, to see what goes on in other districts. And I, I don't hear about this anywhere else. So when um, I, I Somebody else said this is unique to Henrico. So is it anywhere else? Is anybody else endeavoring to do this? I'm really curious. So there have been models of a career ladder across the nation that we have looked at and spoken to representatives from those school divisions, but none are exactly like everything that we are attempting to accomplish in Henrico. So the program is very unique to Henrico. So once again, leading the way, leading which the is a uh, tribute to all of you and and so appreciated by all of us. But I love that we're being innovative. <clears throat> and, I, and I think it also um, needs to be said that our county counterparts really support mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and see this. I mean, because I remember when we were talking to our our counterparts that you know because on the county side there is an ability to move from one la one rung on that ladder of of salary and there are ways to do that in a lot of professions but teaching is just not one of them and i think it's one of the things that teachers have for years looked at other professions and said, well, why not us? So I'm, I'm hoping other people will come to us just like they have with our CTE programs that, that Mac is, is pioneering the way there that we're doing the same thing here. So I think that's wonderful. Um, and um, so I, I, I love that we're doing the apprenticeship program because a lot of people, that, that is the way they learn. They learn by doing that and growing our own, all of that. And I had that ability when I was in the dark ages and learning to be a teacher just from watching my family members. And I would go to school with them and, and do all of that. So I saw firsthand that, that how valuable that is. But I do, um, one thing um, I wanted to follow up on was our, at, at our opportunity schools, that you have specific plans, but I'm curious about the one, the admin and teacher supports. Because one of the things that I think that we need to, to be realistic about is that sometimes teachers need support with 
students who need extra help. They need another set of hands in that classroom. They might have a heavy load of ESL students. They might have students who during the pandemic were, are, there's learning loss there. And they also might have behavior issues, things like that. So sometimes it is those supports are someone else in the classroom like an ESL teacher. So is that on the radar too? I know you talked about having, you know, other people, but you know, specifically, especially in the behavior area, I worry about that for support. So specifically with the teacher fellow, and the, the focus of a teacher fellow really is that new teacher, the provisionally licensed teacher, and in some cases, the board subs. Right. So it's that targeted, differentiated learning that our new teachers need. But in addition, our teacher fellows can and will support all teachers in the building through professional learning and through professional learning communities. In addition, each teacher fellow will be trained in CHAMPS which is a proactive approach to classroom management through student engagement, so strong tier one instruction. So yes, uh, the teacher fellow will be able to kind of work with some of the things that you mentioned, but it would not necessarily be ESL support. Okay. And I think that was the importance of us calling out the fact that we're going to meet with each principal and develop a plan because we want principals to have voice to say, what is it your school needs? Right. You know, the, these schools qualified for opportunity schools based on the metric, as Mrs. Shea said, but even within these schools, each one of them have different needs. And so we right. want the principals to tell us exactly where they feel like there are opportunities for us to support. And as we develop those plans, if ESL were to rise to the top in any of those schools, then we could support from a central. Right. Well, and, and you know, I, I think one of the main ways that we can retain our teachers is to let them know we're listening. Correct. We hear what their mm -hmm. needs are, and then we come in and support them specifically what, because no two schools are alike. No That's two right. populations are alike, and they need different things depending on on what's going on in that area or, or whatever. Um, and I'm especially thinking about the behavior supports because mm -hmm. I know that some of our teachers, especially the ones who are relatively new to the profession, that's an area where they're, they're just, it's hard to know mm -hmm. how to really reach a student who's having behavior problems. Um, so I like the idea of a very specific plan. But one of the things we as a board have talked about so often, and this is just, this list is exactly what we talk about, is putting resources where they're needed. Correct. And whether it's budget, it's personnel, whatever it is, it's putting them and meeting the needs of kids head on. And so that, that's, I think, one of the things that really resonates with me with this is that we're doing what our kids and our teachers need us to do. And I'm hoping that the teachers will feel that support. Um, and that will say, okay, I'm gonna stay in Henrico because I get the support I need. And that's a very basic way of looking at it, but it's also, you don't get that support elsewhere. That's right. So, so I, I am really appreciative, appreciative of the update, but also the, the thought and, and the work that's gone into this. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ackburn. Mm -hmm. Ms. Atkins. So I'm very thankful uh, for the strategy behind this and the time that you took to make sure that it was purposeful. And talking with other district leaders to find out what's working well, what's not working, and let's figure out the pieces that fit here in Henrico County Public Schools. So well done and I applaud everyone uh, because it certainly was an effort that took more than just the individual standing here. However, your leadership uh, in making sure that it became a reality is special. And then I, I also have a message that is for family specific. So I'm gonna turn and shift my head <laughs> this way uh, to the cameras uh, and to let families know that every single position offered in Henrico County Public Schools is to develop the potential of a child. All the positions. And that adults, parents, neighbors, families, 
everyone significantly impacts recruiting and retaining staff. Our children are smart. They are mirrors of what they see and experience. Therefore, if our children are observing behaviors, cursing, fighting, or yelling frequently, in those cases, there will be, they will begin to really believe that that's a standard communication method. And we will see that behavior in the school. And on the other hand, when our children see adults resolving conflicts respectfully and peacefully, then they will start to develop those conflict resolution skills that we want to see in the school and their skills that they will have with them as they become adults. So please understand that in addition to all of this greatness that is happening, we need your help too. The role of an adult in shaping children's behavior and their attitude is the difference in what we need to attract and retain qualified staff, educators, who are committed to providing high quality education. And I, I am hopeful that as adults that all of us will really work hard in modeling the behavior that we want to see in our children and being mindful of what we say, being mindful of what we do around our children and consciously modeling positive behaviors. That's how we get to nurturing environments for children to grow. And the truth is that our future leaders, or perhaps in a few years, they may be your neighbors, but they're in our schools right now and our teachers and our staff need help with behavior. If we want to keep these wonderful teachers and staff that we have, we have to be an image of what we want our children to reflect in our schools. I don't know how else to say that our children are constantly absorbing, constantly paying attention as adults, We've gone through COVID. As adults, we have experience of pain and pleasure. However, as children, we're shaping their pain and their pleasure. And we have what an awesome opportunity to show them how wonderful they are and to be an image of elevation moving forward. That's my message for families. And I did have another thought while I was speaking. And so I'll, I'll turn back this way around uh, regarding the reward. I want to um, learn more about some of our other positions as well, incentives and uh, pay increases specifically. And I want to share with you what those positions are. Of course, not in this moment, but something I hope uh, to see in the future. And so. Uh, and the reason these positions are selected is because I am getting feedback on them. And so I want to be proactive in this moment. And those positions are custodians, cafeteria workers, secretaries, athletic directors, and coaches. Uh, I, I'm hopeful to hear more about those because some of the feedback is around what does advancement look like in those spaces? And so getting ahead of that question before it becomes more of an issue, I think, is wise. Uh, and then lastly, I want to talk, we talk a little bit about this, and uh, Dr. Castro, I'll just mention it in this setting, uh, that there are some virtual courses like geometry that are offered by external partners and they are absolutely experiencing some of the same things that we are. And I'm hopeful on our radar that we are looking into how we can help our virtual students succeed that are dealing with high turnover with our external partners. In addition to that, I would love to learn if we have a plan or understand what solutions look like with our external partners that are having the turnover. I, I mentioned geometry and math specifically because that's where I'm getting the feedback from for those particular classes in math under the, I think, proximity learning and some of the external partners. Those are the spaces where I'm getting the feedback and 
it's, it's becoming stronger and stronger. So I'm hopeful that in that space of staffing, recruit, retain, of course, they're external. We don't do that for them, but it impacts our students. And having turnover in the virtual space will certainly impact them negatively academically. Mm -hmm. So in the future, I'm hopeful to learn more in that space as well. Sure. Thank you for that, Mrs. Atkins. We can certainly get that data and information for the board. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kinsella. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Reverend Cooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So first, I want to begin simply by congratulating uh, the 25 new National Board Certified Teachers. I just want to start there. Um, I want to congratulate us, but also, Dr. Weston, I've heard some feedback from some teachers that began the process, but kind of had to pull out the process because of um, the stress level or the balancing act of uh, working in a high need school and making the year commitment um, to, to achieve and attain this. Can, can we talk quickly about how we help those teachers dealing with the barriers, really, that for them, you know, everybody's um, internalization is different that are preventative for them because truly the number is not as diverse as I wish it would be. Um, you know, gender, race, uh, school, um, district, Fairfield, Verona, Tucker Hope. So could you just speak to that for me? Yeah, so the question that you're asking is one that we are looking to continually tackle. So Henrico, as you noticed, had 25 new nationally board certified. That was the most of any division represented last evening and in the state. What we do differently is that we host our own internal cohorts. And Dr. Baker spends a lot of time visiting schools to it, recruiting and supporting. And the challenge that you mis mentioned is the one that we're looking at as a team and how we can have additional supports at individual schools. Now, some models that we've used in the past is that we have cohorts located at the schools. So that's more time in your building, not having to travel with internal support from our facilitators that are Henrico-based facilitators, our teachers, our current NBCT teachers, and Dr. Fellows. I don't have a perfect answer for you, but it is something that we are continually working to open more doors and to provide more support for all teachers, especially the teachers you just mentioned. No, I appreciate that because this is, this is since we just celebrated them, we just acknowledged them and we, we give kudos to us as division for having the most in the state. And, and when we talk about equity and equality and just talking about the diversity of our population of teachers and as we talk about microcondition, as we talk about professional learning and development, it's important that we are conscious and cognizant of the challenges that have become barriers even to them because I believe that this is definitely um, homogenized in recruit retaining our teachers. So thank you for that. Um, and I've, hopefully as we continue, the numbers will get better. Just talk about not the overall number, but the I'm number great. of great. teachers that are diverse in regards to, you know, all those things. I mean, so thank you. Um, I also want to just say thank you again for this comprehensive um, breakdown of compensation and benefits. Um, I think it's very um, good to have it uh, visual. Um, and then that's on the macro level. And then we can be more definitive with the micro level. Um, can, you, can someone tell me, if not later on, share with me what's the percentage of teachers who are taking advantage of these micro credentialing? Do we have any, or is that too, too nebulous of a question? Well, we started, the official launch was in July, yep. and we've had over 300 teachers this year, and that's those who have completed, and we have ongoing micro credentials, and we'll have that throughout the summer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. Um, that's a good thing. Now, I want to just kind of re reiterate what my colleague said, um, Ms. Shea and um, Ms. Ogburn, in regards to opportunity um, schools. Um, I want to thank Ms. Bowden and Dr. Castro and the staff because I've been kind of talking about this and trying to figure out the ways, as Ms. Ogburn re re referenced, of our creativity when it comes to our um, uh, compensation model. Uh, so we identified these schools, and when we look at the vacancies we have presently, so I want to kind of speak to right now, and we know that's what is to come. Um, Verona High School has 12.4 teacher vacancies, Rolf has 11, Fairfield Middle has 8, Highland Springs Elementary has 14, Glen Lee has 8, and then the Academy of Virginia Randolph has 7. So we look at those numbers, and we know how high they are. Ms. Dr. Hughes, you referenced the awareness of the challenges specifically in Fairfield. 
And in Verona, so the question I raise is, can I get kind of some data on how many long-term subs we have in these schools? Because um, again, as I've stated previously, um, schools that have certified teachers, it's directly related to the academic performance of their students. And so when you have one school that has 14 t teacher vacancies, and so then the correlation becomes performance, academic performance that we get, and we know what some of the um, root cause analysis is. Um, so kind of Ms. Bowden, speak to that, and then I'm asked a follow-up question. I, well, to answer your question, yes, we can certainly provide you the information regard to the number of long-term subs mm -hmm. that are in these uh, schools and positions. But to your point, and I, I think, you know, as we talked about the metric for this opportunity schools, it's you, you certainly called out the vacancy rates being high, and then it's the number of provisionally licensed and or board subs, um, you know, and, and, or unfilled positions, which would then be board subs. So looking at ac absolutely the impact that has on a building and um, and all of those things. Well, to your point, so um, Ms. Bowden, to Dr. Pasha's point, kind of, massage that for me, let me see that picture, because she just basically said it's not just, you know, um, long-term subs, there's some other resources we have in the buildings to kind of compensate for that. So if you can kind of just give me that picture. Right, um, so we're doing a number of things, and I'll, I'll circle back, and hopefully I'm not all over the place, um, because I know you're talking about the here and now. One thing we are doing um, is we recently had a job fair for elementary and we have one scheduled for secondary uh, in March. Um, we are looking at the cream of the crop and perhaps hoping to entice some people to fill our positions now, not only for the next school year. Um, we are working with current board subs who are interested to become fully licensed as well. And we have a number of supports through our partners through tuition reimbursement and grants and those type of things. Um, so we're actively working to identify individuals who are poised to fill those positions or could fill those positions with a little additional support. No, I appreciate that. Again, I just wanna be clear on that, you know, we are aware of this and we realize yes. what the byproduct of this is. Um, thank you for that, and I look forward to getting the data. Uh, Dr. Hughes, quick question. So given everything that Ms. Bowden just stated, um, what, are, what is our long-term kind of um, plan to assist these students um, with academic supports if we recognize some deficiencies in you know, the, the instruction that they're receiving? Sure. Well, uh, we've learned a lot this year, as you can well imagine, as we have really tackled this high vacancy rate and the provisionally licensed teacher rate. And we've talked to a lot of teachers and administrators about what um, these uh, provisionally licensed teachers or board subs need. And we know they need two things. So one bucket is they really need that Hermica way, which Matt talked about earlier. Like they need professional learning and just our um, Henrico learner profile and our instructional model. They need to know, you know, what's expected of instruction. And so that's sort of one set of professional learning that we give that's sort of broad, if you will. And then we really have to meet each one of the teachers where they are because teachers come in as um, Kenya and Francine said, each person comes to a provisionally licensed role with a different set of skills, right? And so we have to make sure that we're meeting each teacher where they are and meeting those needs, which will be how the teacher fellow is so valuable next year because there will actually be boots on the ground. And so I know that doesn't solve the problem quite this year. We've got a lot of things in place as far as central support, specialists going out in buildings, our coaches, ILCs. Um, but moving forward, I think that teacher fellow, coupled with some of the other resources that we're going to be able to put in the schools will be so valuable to meet those individual teachers' needs. Now, again, thank you for the articulation. Mm -hmm. of it. We're not just kind of, you know, guessing at this. We're very Correct. intentional about recognizing that there is learning loss, recognizing there are gaps, and that we're trying to close those gaps. Right. Um, I want to, again, just reiterate, um, thanks, thanks about just the comprehensive nature of the Opportunity Schools mm -hmm. process, because um, the compensation and supports 
but then also the contextualization of implementation. Mm -hmm. um, that's all Ms. Ogburn said. I just said in two words, but, <laughs> but, but the, 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 the intentionality of learning the ethos at the building and right. determining what it is they need that differentiates from another school. Correct. It's not a one size fits all. No, and and as not. we talk about one Henrico, we have to talk about it through the lens of um, individuality right. in the context of where they are. So Absolutely. I look forward to hearing how um, we've made progress. And I'm, I'm just excited that again, thank this you. is this is concretized mm -hmm. for the con con Absolutely. context. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much, Reverend Cooper. Um, my colleagues certainly asked a lot of questions. I do have a few more. Um, and to everyone's point, I think the entire board um, really does appreciate the, um, really just the intentionality, as Reverend Cooper said, about the opportunity schools process. So that we're gonna give um, these schools, um, these students in these schools, but yet the teachers and administrator in the schools more support, whatever it needs um, in their building. Um, I continue to think that until we can fill these gaps, I always think about prep. Is there anything that we can do um, for our teachers and, you know, that, that want to retire? But, you know, we've invested in them. They are valuable resources to us, and they've certainly filled some of our gaps. So do we accept, expect to make any changes to prep, or are we limited by reti uh, retirement rules, IRS rules, and VRS rules, things of that nature? I am so happy to say this. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we are currently looking at revisions to the PrEP policy. And uh, the next step, we have actually made some suggested revisions. The next step is uh, to uh, convene through Ms. Coy focus groups where we're actually talking to current participants and future retirees to see what would entice them into the program. So please stay tuned. We are working on that. Okay, so let me just, um, I'm very excited about that because that's been on my list for a couple of years um, because I believe we've already, you know, just, there's just so much valuable experience in our retired teachers. Would that be open to perhaps future prep folks, current? Mm -hmm. Prep uh, folks or folk, because once you depart, you can't come back and do prep, right. correct? That, that is correct. So the changes would be applicable to current prep participants and future participants. Current and future. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I can't wait for that update. I'm, <laughs> Dr. Cashwell knows how excited I am. We, we talk about it a lot. And I, I'm glad you asked the question because we <laughs> there was so much to highlight in this presentation. And I know uh, we toyed with whether to, to drop a nugget about it. So I'm glad you asked the question. The team has really left no stone unturned. And, and to your point, there are some limitations and some challenges associated with those kinds of programs because of separate, you know, all of the things you just right. mentioned with VRS, but um, they will, uh, they've found a few touch points that may be difference makers and look forward to getting more information directly from our retirees and prep participants about what will be impactful. Well, fantastic. And if I could just share some feedback, I have never talked to a prep participant that didn't say something about health care. I'm just saying, you know, I don't know if it's feasible or not because of the rules associated uh, with retirement, but um, a lot of them speak to the health care cost. Um, so wait a minute. So as to the uh, micro-credentialing, I heard 48, but then I heard over 300. So 48 in January. So 300 for micro-credentials and 48 for specialization. Okay, so 40, the micro-credentials okay. are prerequisites for to apply for a specialization. Okay. And, and you say we've got over 300 interested. Are we, we hearing from, are we hearing from employees that are just like, what can you lift off my plate? Like, I appreciate all this extra that you're making available to me, but I'm really just this work-life balance on top of um, trying to keep up with my job. And um, are we hearing from those employees? Like, what can we do for them outside of referral bonuses? I think um, that's the reality of the feedback that we receive. But the focus of the micro credentials and the specializations was really to provide the professional learning that our staff, our teachers are asking for the most and making it available to them and make and kind of incentivizing it as well. For those who want to stay in the classroom and advance, right? Yeah, Correct. I and think that's, that's what I was going to yeah, an important, <laughs> An important nuance. Yes. And I mean, certainly, you know, 
we're thinking about lots of opportunities mm -hmm. for employees to, um, you know, have their needs met within Henrico schools. And some individuals are looking to grow into leadership, but may not be interested in leaving the classroom. Or they, it may have been in the past that, you know, uh, attaining a master's degree or taking outside courses was cost prohibitive. This eliminates those barriers for teachers. So I'd say it takes a lot off the plate. In some cases, you're not leaving Henrico uh, proper, if you will, even the premises to engage in coursework. It's built in professional development. We're honoring um, things that people have achieved in the past that we've offered. So um, certainly when it's when we're thinking about all employees and compensation and all of those recruit, retain, reward, there are some, some general pieces to that, making sure our, our um, pay rates competitive at all levels of the scale, that our health care uh, premiums, you know, that we're making sure we contribute as much as we can to not pass any cost on to the employees. So certainly not meant to be extra work, but for those who are looking to grow, um, and we hear that from teachers, you know, that, you know, one of the main reasons, uh, you know, that pops up as the reasons teachers leave the profession is no uh, way to advance. And I think Mrs. Ogburn really hit on that earlier, that, you know, the teacher pathway is, um, may feel like, you know, that, that it's that position, which fits the needs of a lot of teachers, but not everyone. So how do you have opportunities for growth and development and leadership uh, in that position? And, and this provides what's really been a missing avenue there um, and is certainly not meant to be a requirement or an extra on anyone and certainly pay advances come naturally through our compensation plan and not just to those who participate here. Okay and then how many of our IAs, you said IAs uh, who want to become teachers, that's very exciting. Have we had a high level of interest there? And I'm not looking for an exact number, I just want a little bit more. I just heard you mention it. We so, have we have had interest. I mentioned th through the Richmond Teacher Residency IA program. That is a fairly new program that started last year, and so we had two IAs to participate. But in addition to that program, our very own special education department overseen by Dr. Katie Smith, um, we have a, a program in which we provide upfront tuition costs for IAs who currently have a bachelor's degree and are aspiring to be teachers. And so we work collaboratively with UVA WISE um, to ensure that they become provisionally licensed. They take the course through UVA WISE and then our members and leaders of our special education department will meet periodically with those IAs to take what they're learning from UVA WISE and kind of hemrichonize it um, so that it is you know, applicable and many of our IAs are in that cohort to become future special education teachers. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. And then um, I think the next thing is, you know, as I look at the chart of public sector and private sector, you know, there are so many reasons employees may leave us. Um, but when I think really uh, outside, my colleagues have addressed our teachers in the comprehensive um, school setting very well. I need to address our CTE staffing, specifically nursing or automotive. These people are specialists in their business. How are, I mean, I, are, what is the answer to um, staffing those positions? Because literally they can make twice as much money in some cases um, working not for Henrico County Public Schools, right? So who would like to take that question as to what we're doing there? <laughs> well, if I had the answer, I'd be a, a very rich man. Uh, but I will tell you, I think part of it, it gets back to what we want in the classroom teaching our young people, because teaching is truly a calling. Um, and so what we find that a lot of people will leave to go get money thinking the grass is greener on the other side, but then they find out their real passion is working with young people. I think we have to do a better job on our end to attract that person that's been out making the money, their kids are grown, they've gone through college, now let's bring them and let them find that passion and, and ignite that in the classroom. So I think that, so it's not always about the money, it's how do we get that passion in front of that person. Uh, and we have internally, uh, with the support of everyone, 
do a lot of bringing people in to help assist us teach. Uh, most recently, today at the Career Rodeo, walking around the business people seeing it are sitting there saying, wow, this is this has got to be so rewarding to work with young people in this way. Uh, but at the end of the day, yes, that is something that hopefully the micro-credentials and all these other opportunities to help bolster the pay and make it equivalent. I don't think we can ever match the pay, but I think when you look at making it equivalent for the amount of work, the passion of doing it, and also the flexibility of the schedule, nursing in particular, most nurses are you know 12 hour days, you know, three days a week. So when they find, I want to match my schedule to my child's schedule, that's when they start looking at us but we need to continue to figure out how to reach that. Now, one other thing we have worked on, working with our business partners, like for instance, Bon Secours, we are actually working on a contract with them now. They will hire the person at their rate of pay, we will pay them what we would normally pay that, that person, and then when we're not using them during the summer, or whatever, they're going back to the hospital and working. For us, that is the best of both worlds because that bolsters their pay. It keeps this person up to date and current on everything that's happening in the workplace and connects their students to that workplace. So for us, that's a win-win-win uh, making that happen. So there are a few business partners that are saying, we need to figure out how to get into the schools with their people because their ultimate goal is to hire the nurses that we put out. So it becomes a win for them as well. Absolutely. I appreciate you highlighting that very much. I mean, specifically to CTE, having spent my morning at the rodeo as well, um, talking to business folks um, and, and just hearing what they have to say, and then also talking to some of our employees, you know, just walking up to them and saying, you know, wow, thank you for choosing, you know, to follow your passion and, and be with our students because you could go to, I think Ford was there. And I was like, because you could go to Ford and make twice as much, almost twice as much money, right? So thank you for highlighting that just specifically around our CTE because I know we have vacancies there and my colleagues have addressed some of our other uh, specific vacancies. And if I might just bring forward um, in support of what Ms. Atkins said about our custodians um, and our office assistants, and our bus drivers, um, and that's a compensation, it's like budget, but it's recruit, retain, reward, um, because as we look at our staffing reports, we continue to see turnover in those positions, um, and I worry about the fall 2023. And then if I may also just add, you know, I know we've talked about discipline and, and so much safety, and um, I've been hearing from some folks about um, safety on our buses. You know, the, right now the focus is, is so much of it is in our schools. And again, um, but I just want to highlight safety on our buses for our bus drivers. And again, it's relevant because recruit, retain, reward. And we as board members get to see the personnel reports and um, which folks are, you know, staying and going. But um, thank you so much for this presentation. As all of our colleagues have said, um, we greatly appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to more thinking outside the box and, uh, and uh, fill in the gaps as we move forward. Dr. Cashwell. Madam Chair, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I thought of one more thing, if you don't mind. I Certainly. Um, I'm wondering, after I look at it, this is a tremendous amount of information. So how are we communicating all of this to our teachers, our staff members? How do we help them digest everything that is now a possibility for them? Thank you. I appreciate it, Eileen. I mean, because when you think about it, it's a lot. And on top of what they're already having to juggle in school and all this, I'm just wondering, how do they find their way forward to, to work it all out. So how are we doing it? So it's multi-layered. Uh, at the schools listed on the screen, the principals will be meeting with staff and speaking with them um, about the Opportunity School Initiative and about the career ladder and how this is all intersecting. For the larger staff community, we will be sending out an email to all staff tomorrow, linking them to a um, a news release and a list of frequently asked questions that are on our website. It will be included in our staff newsletter and we will also be sharing um, actually through our parent newsletter, The Binder, 
next week because there may be some family members who would now like to come and work at one of these schools or any of our schools. And so we're gonna to continue to uh, work with the tools that we have and then also create some handout materials that are available in libraries and other locations throughout the county. And, and I appreciate that because I can just imagine you see this and it could be very overwhelming what the possibilities are and and so I'm, I'm glad I mean multi-layered is the way to go and you hope if they didn't get to read the first time they'll find another way but um, the other thing I'll add is absolute support for what Mrs. Shea said about job sharing when I first started um, with Henrico County we had teachers who were doing that and it works because there are people who, they have time to teach two sections, especially in high school, like you said. And, and my son, when he was at Godwin, he had, there was a math teacher who taught two sections of math. That's what they did. They came in, they taught their two sections, and then they went on to something else, I'm assuming. So I'm hoping that we will see more and more of that because again, that's a way to get people to come back to the profession, maybe even part-time. So. That's, that's correct. You know, it's an infinite amount of licensed, endorsed teachers right Absolutely. now. And so um, we are certainly entertaining that. In fact, it is happening, it, particularly in our secondary levels. Um, we have teachers that are teaching an additional class in combination with part-time teachers that had previously separated and now have returned. Um, it is absolutely working in some of our um, secondary schools and we're certainly entertaining that as an option. And our principals have been very receptive to that, to that process. Well, and if we advertise it mm -hmm. that way, I mm -hmm. think that's the key because people go online, they, they look for a job opening, they see math teacher, they don't know that maybe if I could apply for it for a part-time. So I think that's part of the key too, but I appreciate the fact that y'all are, are going there. So thank you, I'm sorry to jump back in. But, no, not, not at know, all, Sometimes the older you get, the longer it takes to think of things. So, yeah. I understand. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Dr. Cashwell, is that all? Yes, and I again echo the board's uh, thanks and gratitude to the entire uh, central team who've been working so hard on a number of these initiatives and programs and, and bringing them forward in such a concise manner uh, this, this afternoon for all of us. And I also want to thank the board for your continued commitment and support around this area, recruit, retain, and reward. I know you have been uh, vigilant as individuals and as a collective championing um, all of the efforts we've uh, put into place related to this goal, and you continue to challenge us to think differently about this, uh, you know, unique circumstance we find ourselves in uh, troubled waters, if you will, when it comes to the landscape of, of uh, the teacher shortage that we find ourselves in. And so, um, certainly, you've challenged us conti to continue to do hard work and good work in this area, and continue to innovate in that space. So, thank you for your commitment around this uh, work. What what you saw today presented. Was wouldn't be possible without that support and commitment. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Well.